All right, morning, guys. Morning. 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 Those of you that don't know me, I'm Robert Brown with Conrad Fire. I'm your salesman. I'm going to go over a couple things with you on the truck today. Uh, a little history about me and my family is uh, I'm in my 30th year of selling Pierce trucks. Started as a volunteer firefighter in 1972. Didn't figure out that you can get paid to do it or I'd have been retired from it. So be doing this part time maybe. But uh, my oldest son's a driver at Engine One in Lawrence, and my youngest son takes care of all your loose equipment and bumper gear needs and things, those types of things with Conrad Fire as well. So just a little history about us. Um, what we're going to go over this morning is the regeneration process of the engine and uh, some of the things that's changed over the years. Uh, 2006 was the last non-compliant EPA engines uh, out there. In 2007, DPFs come into play. Mufflers went away from all diesel products in the United States. DPF stands for uh, diesel particulate filter, and what it does is it collects soot out of the exhaust stream into a ceramic filter in that chamber. It looks like a muffler, but there's a chamber in there that collects soot. And every once in a while that needs to be cleaned out or burned out. Uh, and the regeneration process takes care of that. And then in 2010, another chamber came into play uh, as a DEF chamber, or a diesel exhaust fluid chamber. And what that does is it emits uh, a urea water mixture into the exhaust stream and takes a lot of the harmful noxes out of the exhaust stream. So you won't have any diesel smell, you won't have any smoke around the truck. You will smell a little bit of an ammonia smell on that. Um, one of the things that I will uh, let you know that when you probably already noticed, when you shut the truck down back in the station, you will hear a pump kick in, mm -hmm. and that is pumping the DEF fluid back from the engine lines back into the tank itself. Uh, that's a very small line, so uh, diesel exhaust fluid will freeze at 12 degrees, uh, so they don't want that freezing in the lines, they don't want it crystallizing in the lines, so they pump that back into the tank itself. Tank on the truck has a heater built into it, so that when you're running the truck or you're out in the winter time and the battery's on, then that heater is activated to not freeze that tank up. So. We'll go through this process and then I'll answer some questions for you um, that you'll probably have when we get done with this and then we'll go out and walk around the truck and go over some of the differences with this truck as uh, compared to what you already have in service. So, all right, Jesse, go ahead. The 2010 Cummins ISL and ISX engines are required to use an after-treatment device, ATD, and a selective catalytic reduction, SCR, device for controlling emissions. This means an additional canister will be installed after the diesel particulate filter, DPF, on all 2010 compliant Cummins engines. The first canister in the exhaust stream contains the diesel oxidation catalyst, DOC, and the DPF. The DPF will trap particulate matter while the engine is running. Over time, soot and ash build up in the filter and must be removed. Soot buildup is removed by heating the filter until the soot oxidizes and turns into carbon dioxide gas. This process is commonly known as regeneration. Ash buildup is removed from the filter by periodic cleaning in a special cleaning machine. The typical ATD is equipped with a differential pressure transducer and three temperature transducers. These sensors allow the engine to monitor soot buildup for cleaning requirements. The second canister in the exhaust system contains the SCR device. This device will reduce nitrogen oxide emissions created during the combustion process. The SCR is a catalytic converter that uses vaporized diesel exhaust fluid, DEF. DEF consists of purified water and urea, an organic nitrogen compound that becomes ammonia when heated. The combination of ammonia and nitrogen oxide in a heated environment creates a chemical reaction. The reaction results in the release of nitrogen gas and water vapor, both of which are found naturally in the atmosphere. All 2010 engines require the use of the same oil and diesel fuel required in 2007 EPA compliant engines. The diesel fuel must be ultra low sulfur fuel, containing 15 parts per million sulfur content, or less. Make sure the pump station being used has the proper fuel type when filling your fuel tank. If ultra low sulfur fuel is not used, the engine might not meet emissions regulations, and the ATD could be damaged. 
Cummins Incorporated recommends that 2010 engines use a high-quality, 15W40, multi-viscosity, heavy-duty engine oil, that meets the requirements of Cummins Engineering Standard, CES 20081, API CJ4SL, for maximum DPF maintenance intervals. Cummins allows the use of CES 20078, API CI4SL, oil with no change in oil drain intervals. However, the after-treatment maintenance interval will be reduced, with the use of CES 20078 oil. Chassis built with 2010 model year Cummins engines, have six instrument panel lamps, to monitor engine and exhaust after-treatment status. The 2010 lamps for check engine, stop engine, diesel particulate filter, high exhaust system temperature, and malfunction indicator, represent the same functions as the 2007 engine functions. The new warning light for 2010 is the diesel exhaust fluid lamp. The amber check engine warning lamp indicates that a non-critical system fault with the engine has occurred. The operator can drive the vehicle to the end of the shift and call service to remedy the problem. The red stop engine warning lamp indicates a major engine fault has occurred, which may result in engine damage. The operator should move the vehicle to a safe location and shut down the engine. The diesel particulate filter, DPF lamp, provides an indication that the filter has not been able to regenerate under the previous engine operating conditions, and is in need of assistance in order to perform an active regeneration. There are progressive stages of need for regeneration indicated by this lamp, as described here. When the light is on solid, it indicates low to medium levels of particulate buildup. When the light is flashing, it means there are medium to high levels of particulate buildup, and that a DPF regeneration is needed. A flashing signal with an amber engine warning lamp indicates a high level of particulate buildup. A DPF cleaning is required immediately. The DPF's first stage, on solid, should allow the vehicle to complete a typical shift of operation, depending on the vehicle duty cycle. This provides time for a vehicle to be returned to a maintenance facility, or for a change in the duty cycle, increase exhaust temperatures by normal truck use, without impacting the current mission. The DPF lamp will turn off to acknowledge when effective assistance, changing duty cycle, or initiating a stationary regeneration, has been provided. However, if assistance has not been provided long enough to complete the regeneration, the lamp will return to the appropriate indication stage. The high exhaust system temperature, HES lamp, provides an indication to the vehicle operator that an active regeneration has been initiated, and that exhaust system temperatures will be elevated above normal levels for the operating condition. The HEST lamp will remain on until the exhaust system temperatures have dropped below 750 degrees Fahrenheit. If the HEST lamp is on and the vehicle speed has dropped below the threshold of 5 miles per hour, the lamp will remain on until the vehicle speed increases approximately 3 miles per hour above the speed threshold and the regeneration process finishes. The diesel exhaust fluid level low lamp provides an indication to the vehicle operator that the fluid level has reached a level where refill is needed. This lamp indicates the reservoir has reached a low level. The operator should refill the reservoir when filling the vehicle with diesel fuel or at the end of the shift. The malfunction indicator, MIL lamp, provides an indication to the vehicle operator that a fault has occurred on an emission-related component, which may result in an engine derate or engine protection shutdown. When the MIL lamp illuminates, the operator should take the vehicle to a service center as soon as possible. Review this chart for regeneration lamp behaviors for all Cummins engines. The passive regeneration process removes collected soot in the DPF under normal truck operations and does not require operator interaction. The operator will see no difference in vehicle performance during the passive regeneration process. When the engine is operating at higher speeds and loads, there is enough energy in the exhaust to remove the collected soot in the filter. This happens naturally and does not require any action by the engine control system or the operator. No extra fuel will be used, nor will excessive exhaust temperatures occur during passive regeneration. Operators may see the DPF light illuminate and turn off while operating the vehicle. This indicates that the soot level in the DPF temporarily reached a moderately high level, but because the engine operating conditions were right, 
the passive regeneration process reduced the soot load. The active regeneration process removes collected soot in the DPF through the addition of hydrocarbons, unburned fuel, to the exhaust stream. When the hydrocarbons enter the DPF assembly, the temperature is elevated to a point where removal of the collected soot can occur. This can happen while the truck is being driven, when in stationary truck operations, or during pumping operations. The operator will be notified of the need for regeneration by illumination of the DPF lamp located in the cab. When the DPF lamp goes on, the operator can provide assistance by either changing the duty cycle or initiating a stationary regeneration using the initiate switch, which is located in the cab within reach of the driver. The following vehicle conditions must be satisfied before a stationary regeneration can be started using the initiate switch. 1. Vehicle speed must be 0 miles per hour. The accelerator pedal and remote accelerator should be at idle. The service brake should be released and the brake pedal should not be depressed. The transmission must be in neutral. This can be confirmed by looking at the Allison transmission shift selector and noting that the current gear and the selected gear are in neutral. N. Finally, engine control mode should be from the accelerator pedal, not PTO, remote PTO, cruise control, etc. When a stationary regeneration event is initiated, the DPF lamp will go off, and the HEST lamp will be illuminated. As the engine adds hydrocarbons to the exhaust stream, the exhaust system temperature goes up. Engine speeds will be increased and the sound coming from the turbocharger will change during the stationary active regeneration process. ISLIS engines will increase speed to 1050 RPM. The ISX 11.9 will increase speed to 960 RPM. The ISX 15 will increase speed to 900 RPM. The procedure will take 20 to 40 minutes, depending on the amount of soot accumulated in the filter. Breaking any of the required conditions will stop the regeneration process and engine operation will return to normal. If excessive soot buildup remains in the DPF, the DPF light will return to the appropriate indication stage until an adequate regeneration occurs. When regeneration has been completed, the HEST lamp will remain illuminated until the exhaust outlet temperature is below 525 degrees Celsius or 977 degrees Fahrenheit or the vehicle speed exceeds 5 miles per hour. The following vehicle conditions must be satisfied before the engine will initiate an automatic active regeneration. 1. Accumulation of soot in the filter, to the point where the engine control system looks for opportunities to actively regenerate the DPF. 2. Sufficient exhaust flow and temperature conditions, typical pumping or driving conditions should be adequate. 3. Speedometer showing 5 miles per hour or higher vehicle speed. When the engine determines that it is appropriate to initiate an active regeneration, it adds hydrocarbons to the exhaust stream. The HEST lamp will illuminate during a DPF regeneration while dosing. It is also triggered at temperatures above 1000 degrees Fahrenheit and will not shut off until the exhaust temperature drops below 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Breaking any of the required conditions will stop the regeneration process. If excessive soot buildup remains in the DPF, the DPF light will return to the appropriate indication stage until an adequate regeneration occurs. No engine speed or load changes will occur during regeneration in pumping or driving modes. Activating the regeneration process requires the operator to press the regeneration switch under the previously described conditions. The locations of the regeneration switch are listed below for specific chassis. If the soot load in the DPF builds up, and the necessary conditions for regeneration cannot be achieved, the engine lamps will indicate a more serious condition. If this occurs, operators should be mindful of the potential for gradual power to rates due to higher soot loading. If the DPF lamp begins to flash, along with a solid check engine light, the operator may need to take action. This action could be removing the truck from a mission that requires very high load operation changing the duty cycle to allow a regeneration to occur, or initiating a stationary regeneration. When the soot load is reduced through effective regeneration, 
the engine will return to full torque output. As the soot in the filter is removed in the regeneration process, a small amount of ash is left behind in the filter. Over time, this ash will build up to the point where it must be removed. The engine control system can differentiate between soot buildup and ash buildup. The ash is removed by disassembling the DPF and cleaning the filter in a special machine. The target for regular maintenance is a 200,000 to 400,000 mile interval, which is dependent on the duty cycle, the type of oil used, and the oil consumption rate. Using CES20081 API CJ4SL oil will maximize the DPF maintenance interval. When the engine senses a buildup of ash, it will light the check engine lamp and activate a fault code. The ash removal service event usually takes less than 30 minutes, not including removal and installation. The operation of the SCR device does not require any driver involvement. The driver is responsible for filling the DEF reservoir to maintain the proper amounts of DEF fluid required by the engine. The DEF reservoir on Pierce Custom Fire Apparatus is 4.5 gallons. The fluid level sensor transmits the fluid level directly to the after treatment control module, ACM. The ACM is programmed with specific operational parameters, which will trigger the DEF indicator, as well as induce vehicle performance to rates. As the fluid level drops in the DEF reservoir, the following reactions will occur. DEF level between full and one quarter full, the DEF fluid low lamp will remain off. DEF level between one quarter full and one eighth full, the DEF fluid low lamp will illuminate solid. DEF level below one eighth full, the DEF fluid low lamp will flash. As the fluid level drops in the DEF reservoir to dangerously low levels, these additional reactions will also occur. DEF level below 10% tank level, the DEF fluid low lamp will be flashing. DEF level below 5% tank level, the DEF low lamp will be flashing, check engine lit solid, and MIL lamp lit solid. The engine will induce a 55 mile per hour speed limit. DEF tank empty and ignored. The engine has been intentionally shut down, with the key switched off. The DEF low lamp will be flashing, check engine lit solid, stop engine lit solid, and MIL lamp lit solid. The engine will induce a 25 mile per hour speed limit. Refilling the DEF tank will deactivate any speed limits and warning lamps. The DEF reservoir will be located in the driver's side rear wheel fender, behind the forward air bottle storage door. The illustration below shows the standard location. The DEF reservoir mounting location on a Pierce Custom Fire apparatus will vary. The reservoir will have a blue cap and the label, DEF fluid only. No modification of the exhaust between the engine and DPF is allowed per the EPA. Only tailpipes after the DPF are allowed to be changed. Pierce Custom chassis will be outfitted with diffuser exhaust tips. These devices lower exhaust gas temperatures as they exit the tailpipe. Customers should not remove any diffuser items from their apparatus. Consult a Pierce dealer for exhaust extraction systems that are compatible with the Pierce diffuser tips. Pierce custom chassis will be configured with the fan locked on during pumping operations. All 2010 engines are configured to engage the fan clutch during parking brake and pump in gear situations. This is done to prevent overheating when trucks are operating at elevated high idles for extended periods of time. Any customer installed hardware needs to be kept a minimum of 6 inches away from any exhaust pipe and after treatment device housing. Installation of aftermarket components shall follow this to prevent heat related damage. You guys have questions? You said the exhaust air is cleaner than the air in California. Is there a need for a station exhaust system? Uh, it still has some CEOs in it, so, you know, it's not as critical as it's been in the past, but it's still recommended for NFPA. Okay. What but, kind of boost does it put on there? The, the way it is at a 90, it, we're afraid it's going to take it has to form some of the boost off of the ones we've got. We don't have a very fancy system that we just got like a rubber boot. You probably need to get the air, the air boot that goes it's around. Easy, it's just a right, rubber boot. Rubber boot. So we we'll probably need the magnetic magnet that pulls back up off of it.
Yeah, uh, that works real well, and then and there is an adapter. Do you have a plywood bit system? We uh, have a home built system. Home, home built system. system. Okay. Yeah, they do have. There is adapters for those boots that are magnetic, uh, and then a magnetic adapter that goes on the truck itself. Uh, like some of them, some of them just have a stop plate that goes back about six inches or so, six or eight inches on the exhaust diffuser, and then goes on there and magnetizes to it. So there's several different ways of doing it. Uh, just whatever works best. You manually, I guess. Well, right now we're kicking it off. We, we just leave it off. So we're pretty yeah. much tear it off. We don't want to tear the system out tomorrow. Right. So. Right. Well, a lot of the exhaust on everything anymore just comes out at a 90. It can come back at an angle, but it still has to come straight out of the truck because of the exhaust heat when you're doing regen. Yeah. When you're doing a park regen. Yeah, you blow the tire, of course. <laughs> well, it blows out ahead of the tire. Uh, but the exhaust temperatures get really high when you're doing uh, when, it, when you're doing a park regeneration. That's why the temperatures they're not high enough down. to mess with you during normal no idle or no no not at all. So unless you're doing a park regeneration, you're not going to notice any exhaust temperature changes different than pumping or driving or anything like that. That will remain the same. What does change is when you do a park regeneration and it dumps all raw diesel fuel into that chamber and ignites it. So you do have elevated exhaust temperatures at that point in time. And then your truck's going to run rough. You notice that it said that you'll notice a, a, a change in the sound. Uh, it does that to build heat into the engine. So if you, if you go back to the station, the truck sits there for a few hours and cools down and all of a sudden you turn the batteries on, the switch on, and it tells you it needs to be a regen. You pull it out of the bay and pull it out on the apron to do that. You'll notice the truck running very rough, and what it'll do, it, it, it applies the jake brake to three cylinders to boost the heat in the engine. So it will run rough. You'll think the truck's falling apart, you know, and, and something's wrong with it, but that's the way it's designed to build the heat in the engine to be able to do the regeneration process. In a timely manner, the the illustration said 20 to 40 minutes. Realistically, on 2017 trucks, it's going to probably be about 12 minutes or so, 12 to 15 minutes to do a park regeneration. Most of the time, it will do an automatic regen, and you'll never know it unless you actually see the high exhaust temperature light come on on the dashboard. While you're driving it, you mean? Yeah, while you're driving it or pumping it, it, it could do that, but it doesn't dump raw diesel fuel in and ignite it at that point in time because normal pumping and driving operations, your exhaust temperature and the parameters are met to be able to do it anyway. So you won't notice any, won't even notice any difference in the engine at that point in time either. It'll continue to run smooth and you won't notice anything on it. But uh, one of the guys in the earlier class was mentioning that he had never seen it where they had to do a park regeneration. So the chances are it's probably been doing automatic ones uh, the newer trucks, over the last three years, they have set it to where the soot buildup doesn't get as high in that chamber before it actually does a regeneration. So you're going to probably not notice it doing it, but it'll do it more often and take a lot less time to do it. If you're out on a scene and you know you're not going to be pumping, the accident scene or whatever, and you're going to be sitting there for a while, kick up your high idle. And that helps, and that'll help reduce that soot build. So, so as a rule of thumb, just high idle every time you're going to be parked. Yeah. yeah. And if you go in to pump gear or need to move the truck or whatever, anyway, the high idle is going to automatically disengage whenever you do either one of those functions. So, so there's really no need to kick it off. It'll automatically kick off on its own. Yeah, our boots for our exhausts on our other trucks are set up at a 45. It kind of kicks out sideways. So yeah, and we, and we can set them up that way. This truck happened, happened to be a stock unit that was sitting there built. So, it, and I don't know if the uh, like seven or last one we got, I don't know where they're how they are set up. But, but the chances are they're exactly like this. Like this one. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. The other thing that's changed on the, on the new on 2017, 16, and 17 engines is. Used to be when you'd go back to the station, shut the truck off, use the ignition switch to kill the truck, turn your battery switch on, and then a lot of people would go back and turn the ignition switch on. So that when they when That's they jump to the truck, okay, don't do that anymore. The new bad 
the new engines do not like it, it'll throw a code into it, or it has a chance of throwing a code into the engine and transmission. So be sure and turn your battery switch off and your ignition switch off. Yeah, no. okay, I've been turning it off. Yeah, well, and most people usually do because it saves you a couple of seconds, you know, and, and uh, when getting into the truck and being ready to go. But so the, new engine, the new engines do not like that. Does it make it start harder? No, it'll probably just throw a code in there. It'll throw a fault code in there, and then you'll get an indicator on the dashboard that you've got a fault code in, either in the engine or the transmission. So, okay. you know, it's all kind of crazy. Yeah, I haven't yeah. done that yet. So, yeah, but just a precautionary measure. Any other questions? They gave us some uh, uh, valve stem supports for the front wheels mm -hmm. and I tried to put them in there and they were too big. I don't know that we really need a support on the front wheel. Front, anymore. it's not as critical as it is on the rear. It can be all solid coming from the inside out. But yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, it's not as critical. On the, so. I mentioned the pump on the DEF tank uh, when you shut the truck off. Yeah, we've heard it. We didn't know what uh, One was. of the other things uh, one of the crews mentioned that the high idle coming up automatically that will happen if you hit around 11 volts uh, the automatic high idle will kick in itself uh, and idle up so be sure when you're back in the station be sure to keep plugged in uh, one it uses electricity that pump pumping back in to the to the DEF tank uh, it uses electricity and air so that will keep everything charged up for you there is no way to shut the vacuum alarm off for the, to save the backup guy's ears on these trucks, is it? No, and it's progressive, so <laughs> the further you are away from it, the louder it is, and the closer you get, it, it does get softer, but not very soft. You have to wear your earmuffs to do that. They're loud. They're loud. They're set up, I think it's 115 decibels. It's pretty loud. It's a slaughter normal truck, one of those trucks in high degrees, so they're, they're loud. It's all changed in the FDA since then. So, is there a pump in the upper AC unit that pumps the condensated water out of that upper unit? No, it's all gravity yeah. fed. Uh, tubes coming down on each side of the engine tunnel is where those tubes run down. So it's all gravity fed. It will not. Here in the stone. You won't have any. Put here in the DEF pump. Probably. Yeah. It's there's not like a pump in the AC unit. It, it's all gravity fed. It sounds like it's coming from up. Might have been just a compressor not shutting. You know, if you had well, at that time the air conditioner wasn't fixed. It didn't. It was out of fluid. Okay. When they were, they were running it without fluid, basically. It might have been trying to run. Might have been. So that was probably it. But it was probably the compressor in the ceiling. Oh, there's one up there. Okay. Yeah, there was something making a racket up there. It looked like it was broke. Might have been a fan or, or something in the system trying to charge it. 